Well, hello, dear ones, and greetings from the Center for Contemporary Mysticism in Philadelphia. It's a real joy and an honor for you to be with us today and for us to be in your presence. My name is Joe Irwin, and we'd like to welcome new friends before we begin our program. So if you're new to the center, we hope you can fill our warm, genuine welcome to each of you. Uh, if you're new also, we invite you to check out our website where you'll find many videos and uh, past programs and other speakers like we're having today, groups that you may p- participate in, resources, and it's all at contemporarymysticism.org. So if you feel what we're doing is important, we invite you to get involved, to join or support the center, any amount of support or Uh, involvement is received with gratitude and humility. So we hope that you will find something here at the center that is meaningful for you and that you can be involved. Our goal is to be a partner with you in your spiritual journey. That's our goal. So today we're very excited to have a special guest on our program. Our guest is Rabbi Sheila Peltz Weinberg. She's an activist, an author, spiritual director, and leader in many ways of the Jewish mindfulness movement. She's served as a congregational rabbi for 17 years and has published widely on feminism and social justice and mindful meditation from a Jewish perspective. And also today, she's going to help lead us in a discussion on mystical experience as sort of a common ground and how we can use that to create fields of care in a time of of great polarization. So Rabbi Weinberg, welcome to you. We warmly welcome you and hope you'll be a part of the center family going forward. Uh, we love to make new friends, and we're glad to have you as a part of our group. We'll also join now by our very own Patricia Pierce. As you know her quite well, she's not only a former pastor, author, mystic, a spiritual teacher, and companion who leads a number of uh, companion groups. She also has a tremendous podcast you'll want to uh, check out. So most of her time today really is working with groups and assisting individuals who want to be a part of this transition, this global global transition that is going on today. So the way our program works is we're going to have a time with uh, Rabbi Weinberg, our guest of the day, and Patricia and uh, Rabbi Weinberg will have a nice uh, conversation on a variety of topics and Uh, explore mysticism and all the different things we've talked about. And then at some point, we'll open it up for questions where you'll have an opportunity to come on board and uh, ask a question, have a chance to dialogue one-on-one with Rabbi. And uh, that's that's a great time uh, also. So uh, without now, when you get to that point, remember, if you want to ask a question, you have to raise your hand. There's a little button on everyone's screen that says raise your hand. So we won't do that now. But as you're listening to the conversation uh, going forward here, if you think of a topic or a note or a question, jot it down so that you don't forget it. And that way, when we come to our Q&A section, you'll be able to uh, come on and talk with Rabbi Weinberg or Patricia Pierce and, and ask questions and dialogue with them. So we're really excited about it today. So Patricia, I'll turn it over to you and Reverend Weinberg, and you. I'll disappear for a while, and you folks take it away and have a wonderful conversation. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello, Sheila. It's Hi, uh, so great to see you, and I've been looking forward so much to our conversation, and um, I've been privileged to be able to have some really wonderful conversations with you over the years. So this is great. Thanks for being with us. Uh, so you served for many years as a congregational rabbi, and then at some point you transitioned out of that and helped found the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. Can you, just to give our listeners a little bit of background, can you share with us what prompted you to make that move and how was that feeling like a calling to you to start that institute. Thank you, Patricia. Great to see you in this context. Always good to see you. Um, Well, let's see. Um, I suppose um, my becoming a rabbi was connected to a spiritual search for me. And I was influenced by various, various streams, including Jewish feminism. That was 
beginning. That was a very important stream, which also had a spiritual component to it, very important spiritual component to it. Um, I was actually influenced by um, 12-step work as well, Mm -hmm. very powerfully, personally. Uh, And I was influenced by some uh, Jewish teachers who were beginning to unpack Jewish mysticism, foremost being um, Art Green, was very well known, and also Reb Zalman, who was coming out of Europe. You know, he he grew up in Europe in a period before the Holocaust, and he brought with him. However, um, then I discovered meditation, and I didn't discover it in a Jewish context. I discovered it in a Buddhist context. But my friend and teacher, who was Jewish, Sylvia Borstein, and also a major Buddhist teacher, kind of, we just sort of connected. And then we started teaching together and realized the one thing we don't have so much in synagogue life or Jewish life or uh, collegial life, you know, when we come together for conferences or meetings, we don't have silence. We don't have the willingness to touch internally. And it felt like this was profoundly Jewish, not necessarily Buddhist. It was, it was universal. It was, cont- it could be contemporary. So we started doing um, retreats with Jews. And then I met um, Rabbi Rachel Cow and I knew her. And she was very interested in this and also had some connections in the funding world uh, who also knew Art Green and one and Rabbi Nancy Flam who was also, they had been involved in something called the Jewish Healing Center. So together, really, we said, let's experiment with this and let's try something of bringing, we'll start just bringing rabbis together and give them an opportunity to settle into some silence, teach sources of Jewish mysticism, do some embodiment and really let them feel safe and held rather than, you know, Let's get our ego on the line here or our intellect, which is great. But this is something else. We're touching into something else. So that was really the origin of it. And we had no idea how it was going to go. Mostly the beginning people were our friends, you know. <laughs> yeah. And it caught hold. It seemed to be uh, meeting some need that people were feeling. And, yeah. And you've yeah. traveled internationally and, and certainly nationally teaching Many, many, many groups of people. And so I'm curious, as you as you began to experience meditation yourself and experience that going inward into the silence, um, and and then you you understood that this is also at the core of Judaism. Can you speak more about that and how you see that as an essential element of of Judaism and partic- maybe particularly mystical Judaism? I think the essence in the silence is seeing how um, non-solid our experiences, how fluid our experiences, including the experience of the self, Mm -hmm. uh, particularly the experience of the self. Um, And the more you can see that, it, it can be shocking, it can be horrific. You can run from it, you can hide from it, you can fear it. Uh, Or over time, and given teaching and practice and settling in, one could see it as, you know, revealing the concealed. Uh You know, and what is Judaism about, but ultimately revealing the concealed. What hides behind everything is the life force, whatever we want to call it. Um, There is no name. There is no form. It's fluid. It's becoming. It's alive. And ultimately, that can be seen all of our practices in Judaism, if I think of them, prayers and practices are really to, you know, connect to that flow, that divine, we call the divine flow and the connection. Um, And we see it. It's one thing to talk about it and have it, you know, quotes and books. And we do read books and we have quotes, but it's a different between having one's own experience. I think this is a little bit where the feminism comes into. Mm, say more about that. Well, yeah. where women's experience, you know, women are more, have been in a sense and are more in touch with lived experience, I think. 
uh, traditionally and classically. Mm-hmm. You know, not that women can't be intellectual, but and certainly since the Enlightenment in the last period of time, very you know intellectually mm-hmm. emphasis, huge intellectual emphasis, which has value, but it also cuts off. And then we find out that this is nothing new. We didn't discover this. You know, like you said, there's there's plenty of teachings that have touched into that. Yeah. You know. In yeah. Judaism, as in Christianity, as in all the faiths. Right. So it's getting in touch with that essential the essential <laughs> say isness, uh the um the I am who I am, I am who I am becoming. Like it's just the essential isness of of what it is of beingness so that practice of opening up to that and as you're saying recognizing the insubstantial nature of of the self and who we believe we are as these isolated individuals and and thinking about isolated individuals i want to have you talk about you've written a couple of books already and you have one that's uh, in the works right now that's called let us breathe together and of course, that's the title of our event today. Let us breathe together, and tell us how how that title came to you, and how how that speaks to you right now. Let us all breathe together. It was um, it was the New Year, the Jewish New Year, um, not this past September, the September before, I guess, twenty twenty, and I was asked to do a a sermon, basically. Uh, that was going to go online and for the movement that I'm connected to the reconstructionist movement. And I don't know why, but for some reason I connected I, the, the one ritual for the Jewish new year, Rosh Hashanah that's in the Torah is blowing the shofar mm-hmm. and, you know, the Ram's horn. Yeah. And there are all kinds of rules about that and all kinds of understandings of what it means. But, I was thinking, I was in the middle of the COVID. We had just had in the summer, you know, the Black Lives Matter. And we were remembering that whole, I can't breathe and all the things that went on, George Floyd. And and, um, Trump was still the president, Mm -hmm. actually. Um, And in particular, we hadn't really gotten even to vaccinations or anything. It was just like, we can't breathe together. We're masked, you know, Mm -hmm. and here is the symbol of breathing. And then we're always thinking about climate change and the the terrible vulnerability of the planet with human use and misuse, the animals, the plants, everything, the air, so kind of all together, the blowing of the shofar, um, I can't breathe, the oppression on that level, the COVID, the climate, it's like, what's the prayer? What's the ultimate prayer that somehow we can remember, we can be called, we can call each other to breathing together and knowing that we're breathing together, you know? Yeah, Yes. It's really knowing that we are doing this. Where does the breath come from? Where does it go? Yeah. And the shofar, I've heard you talk about that as a call to wake up. Right. It's the call to wake up. And it feels like this is the time that we are in. It's almost like this time is the blowing of the shofar. It is, right? It is the call for us to wake up to this essential truth that we are all breathing together, whether we are aware of that or not you know the air that we're breathing has been breathed by every <laughs> you know we're we're all breathing the same and and breath also of course has a very central place in in spiritual understanding and certainly in meditation right so it's like breath is like this thread that's running running through that say more about how breath figures into uh jewish understanding and spirituality well, uh, there are several names for breath, words for breath in Hebrew, and they all relate to spirit or soul. They're all similar. They're almost words for spirit and soul. Nishama, nishima, ruach is, is breath, but it's also wind, and it's also spirit. Uh, nefesh is also breath. So 
there's an ancient understanding of that connection. I mean, we begin our lives with breath. Yeah. We end our lives with breath, our first breath, our last breath, you know. And then in meditation, we used to do this. Um, the name of, in, in, we don't pronounce God's name, you know. We don't pronounce God's name, but there are letters. There are four letters. Sometimes they're said as Yah- Jehovah or Yahweh. But their their breaths, I think this is Arthur Waskow's teaching yeah. initially. I heard it from him. Yod He Vav He. The four letters are all breath. <sighs> yeah. Breathing in and breathing out is simply, you know. And yeah. when we breathe in, again, like you said, the breath, we don't do it. We don't bring life to ourselves. Mm. Mm. You know, we live in an age that is so individualistic and self-centered and you know, we're the ones in charge, you know. So just just sitting with the breath and realize you don't breathe it in. Mm-hmm. You're not really breathing. You're being breathed. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah life is breathing us. Right. Together. Yeah. But we don't think of that, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In meditation, when you have enough quiet and you can calm down and get rid of some of the infinite distractions that we have in this life you know that's when it can emerge right. that's why i'm so into doing those meditation retreats yeah and that coming into that awareness of you know that unity of consciousness that that awareness of the of the unity of all being is in my lexicon the essence of what the mystical experience is you know the mystical experience is when we are in a sense sort of transported out of our isolationist mind and we are all of a sudden recognizing you know that there there's this whole vast thing beingness that we are part of and and I want to hear you talk about because part of your work has not only been in the area of spirituality and meditation and and really bringing that to the fore it's also been in the area of structural and systemic, systemic issues. And certainly with the Black Lives Matter and, you know, I can't breathe. We're looking at all of this together, right? We're looking at the consciousness that we're holding and how that's playing out in the world. So tell us, share with us some of what you have been working on in terms of addressing some of the systemic, these, yeah. Share with yeah, us. yeah. I mean, that started off early in life, I suppose. I was a child of the '60s, so and then it kept coming in different kinds of ways, in in different forms, um, back and forth. You know, pulsating back and forth, recognizing you know a tremendous amount of privilege as a white person, and just really deepening understanding of what racism is. I some maybe five or six years ago. We went down, my husband and I and two friends, we went down to, we did a a civil rights trip and really met face to face and connected to some incredible organizations, Equal Justice Initiative and some really amazing people and realized this is not, this is, you know, we have been inculcated, indoctrinated with separation. This is how separation happens. Whites are separated from blacks. We are separated from the others. We're separated from the old. We're separated from the young. Whatever it is, we've been inculcated with those separations and those judgments. They're in our mind and they're in the systems. And they've been perpetuated in the systems and our minds have been products of the systems. And it's a sort of interflow. And you just can't change your mind without changing the system. But you can't change the system without changing the minds. Right. You know? Uh, and I'll tell you the, the, the particular group that I'm involved in now, I, I suppose I can speak of that. I mean, involved, you know, you want to be involved in groups. It, there's no end to it. You know, how does one even deal with one's limitations? And, you know, we, we were anti-war. I was out there speaking against invading Iraq 20 years ago. I mean, thank you very much. You know, Afghanistan. Um, the, 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 but as a Jew, I'm very, and someone who's lived in Israel, the state of Israel, since I was 16, I spent a year there. I've spent years there over the, my entire life. 
and I have tremendous amount of pain around um, the current situation. I don't have an answer to the absence of peace. I don't have an answer to what I call the occupation, to ending the occupation. But in 2018, my husband Maynard and I traveled to Israel, Palestine, with a group called Combatants for Peace. And since then, the last three or so years, since we came back, we sort of organized in support of this group. And these are former Israeli uh, fighters from the Israeli soldiers and former Palestinian fighters who were sometimes terrorists, might have been called terrorists. They were imprisoned in many cases. And each of these groups have gone through a process. Each of these individuals and groups have gone through a deep, profound internal process to say, that's not my enemy. That's not the other. This is a person in pain. I'm a person in pain. Can I share my story with this person? And violence is not the answer. That's one thing that's clear. Violence is not the answer, period. It's been the answer of humankind for, I don't know, Cain and Abel. I mean, I don't know, you know, (laughs) but it's not the answer and it's not the solution. So to work nonviolently together, Palestinians and Israelis, uh, Israeli Jews and Palestinians, um, Christians, Muslims, Jews, whatever they're secularists, it's not important what their religions are. They're doing this deep work and they are committed to nonviolence and they're committed to the freedom of both peoples and the end of the occupation. So it's become something that I really care about and support. We both do. And we have a local group and um, who knows, I'd like to go back maybe to uh, take another trip there and support them. They have a website, the Badger Peace, if anybody's interested. I just think they're, you can't do everything. I would love to be involved in more things, but there's a limit to this. They're all connected. You know, they're yeah. all connected. Yeah, they sure are. This group has the inner and the outer, really. You know, as does, yeah. you know, many other groups, you know, yeah. Black Lives Matter groups and uh so many other groups, um, grassroots groups. Mm-hmm. Yes. I really appreciate what you're saying about the, the systems reflect the consciousness and the consciousness is shaped by the system. So it's like this feedback loop, you know, and how do we begin to break that feedback loop and how, how, trained we have been to see one another through that lens of separateness and enemy like you were just saying and and i really appreciate how the combatants for peace for example people are choosing to step out of that indoctrination and transcend through action and through relationship right transcend that consciousness of being separate from one another. And I'm actually reminded, I was just speaking the other day with a friend of mine who used to work with a group that brought um, teenage uh, Jewish Israeli girls and teenage Palestinian girls together for maybe similar in a work. And that the first thing they would do when they brought people together is they would have them pair up and and feel feel the carotid artery of the other person. Isn't that incredible? To feel this person has a pulse. This person has a heart just like mine. You know, and when we do that, that's where the whole story just kind of collapses. You know, this whole story that we're trained into. Right. And we're trained out of fear. Yeah. You know, it's fear that drives all those narratives of separation. It's trauma, Mm -hmm. you know, um, ancestral trauma. And and then it's manipulation by people that want power. Right. It's a way of getting power by manipulating fear, which is right there. It's so easy to manipulate through fear. So this is really... (laughs) You know, 
it's dangerous. Uh, you know, it's dangerous <laughs> to that, that power structure for people to be reaching across these barriers, these boundaries. Right. I'm also aware that when we do that, it's almost, so I come from a Christian background, as you well know, and we talk about the sacraments and, and a, you know, something that is sacramental. And I think of sacramental action as mm-hmm. something that it brings like the sacred into the tangible, right? And that feels like sacramental action that, you know, what you're describing and all of these groups that are, that are bringing people together to experience our inherent unity. It feels sacramental. And when we do that, not only are we changing the system, but we're changing our mind yes. that's feeding the system, right? Yes. Yes. I was just a couple of weeks ago into Washington for a, um, a, you know, fossil fuels, um, how to stop fossil fuels. And it was a, um, it was organized and inspired by indigenous people and frontline people and the speakers and the main leaders and were native people, indigenous people. And there was a multi-faith group that we were part of and there were white people and there were black people, but they, in this structure, they were given priority. Mm -hmm. And if you had a problem with that, it was your problem. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and I realized, talk about changing the mind. This is not usual. This is not usual. You know, these are not the powerful people that usually get the for- forefront of things. Yeah. And it was really, you know, and sometimes I got frustrated and bored. And I thought, let it go. Mm. Mm. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. I'm so aware that the whole concept of tikkun olam is so core in Judaism, you know, repairing the world and healing the world. And, and what we're, what you're talking about in your work, that the healing of the world happens in conjunction with the healing of the mind, the liberation of the mind, that the two are not can't be separated. And I think a lot of times those of us in the, you know, the spiritual world, we still like to separate them in a sense, you know, like we separate the mind and the body. Yeah. Goes back to Descartes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, And yeah, absolutely. How do we remember and reconnect and, in the social justice world, even the Tikkun Olam world, you know, there can be a lot of cruelty, ego, mm-hmm. um, lack of relationship hierarchy. Yeah. All, even though the values may be great, you know, the way it's so. And, right. and in the yeah. in this in the individual world, you know, it could be and we're accused of being, you know belly button gazers and you know withdrawn and you know i at the beginning when we were going to do meditation you know that's not jewish you know we have to be out there you know it's not jewish to sit there quietly are you kidding you know yeah so you're right it's i i guess we're just in the beginning on some level of making that integration yeah you know yeah yeah, I don't remember who said this, but I remember I heard it quoted, but um about there's there's trying to think ourselves into new actions, but there's also acting ourselves into new ways of thinking. And that sometimes when we challenge ourselves to step outside of our conditioned ways of thinking or seeing the world, what happens in the end is we our mind changes. Like our own consciousness changes. Right. And that's oftentimes in relationship. Yes. With someone who's does different. it ever happen outside a relationship? Right. Cause I don't know. Does it, can it, can deeply transform transformational experience happen outside a relationship? I guess everything is relationship ultimately. That's an interesting question. I think oftentimes we sort of, you know, we abstract or we create our stereotypes of who 
you know, the other is. But until we actually are relating as human beings, we're still in our heads. Right, right, right. So as you, Sheila, as you look at the times that we're in right now and the turbulence that we are in, nationally, globally, when you kind of zoom out and look at it from from the perspective of this whole idea of of moving outside of our ideas of separateness, what do you see in the world when you look right now? I guess I see blessing and curse. You know, going back to the uh, Hebrew Bible and Deuteronomy, uh, I I give you today um, blessing and curse. I see both. I see both. I see both all the time. All the time, constantly, um, there's tremendous amount of um, deepening practice, and you know the combatants is only one group, but there are a lot of groups like this. You, you interviewed Paula Green, and she has, you know, and there there are places and congregations and communities that are really doing that inner work. Um, I've been very connected to this one teacher, John McCransky. I've talked to you about him. He was drawing on the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. He talks about the most important thing we can do is create a field of care Mm -hmm. and feel deeply that we're cared for. And then we can see all the obstacles, Mm -hmm. you know? So there's, there's great work doing being done. It's amazing. The world is so interconnected that some of the greatest spiritual traditions are, are accessible. The shamanistic traditions, the indigenous traditions are rising up. Again, the West is having a chance to experience uh, the East, the Buddhism and the Hinduism, and yoga, you know, and all of that could be commercialized. It yeah. could all be capital. It could all be subsumed by capitalism. Yeah. You know, it could all be demeaned mm-hmm. um, and it could all be distorted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had the distorter in chief, I mean, uh, in my view, mm-hmm. as president, and we don't know that he's not going to be president. And I, you know, I just think, oh, my God, again, there's there's frightening news. There was this huge anti-Semitic uprising in Poland just a couple of days ago. Mm-hmm. Polish anti-Semitism really hostile to any memory of the suffering of the Jews and filled with hate, ancient hate has not been abolished. So, you know, I'm old already, you know, I don't, uh, you know, my most important thing I can do right now is just be there for the young people to the extent that I can, you know, to the extent that they're open or care or um, I'm fortunate I have my own grandchildren (laughs) Um, my little five-year-old, she had her birthday on Friday, uh, my youngest granddaughter, Ariel, and, um, she, she goes to a, a, um, charter school in Harlem, New York, um, with very mixed population. And, um, for after school, she goes to Lubavitcher, which is <laughs> two days a week, which is a very hot ultra-Orthodox, mystical strand of Judaism. But, and she has a lot of different impulses coming, you know, different inputs coming into her. She's five years old. So I said to her, Ariel, I just want to talk to you a little bit about God, Hashem, the name. Oh, she says, Hashem is everywhere. I said, yeah, and where, where is Hashem? And my soul, Hashem is in my soul. I am a part of Hashem. Wow. Now, this child is five. Huh. Wow. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, maybe there's hope. <laughs> yeah, for really. <laughs> really. That's really said, moving. Oh, yeah, thank you. It's, it's like, wow. I love that. It's like, wow. You know, so, you know, and there's, you know, there's just a lot of, because things are turbulent, authoritarianism is very um, seductive. Yeah, especially when there's a lot of fear. 
when there's fear and there's turbulence and there's fear and there's turbulence. Yes. And authoritarianism and the certain mentality of a person that can take advantage of that. So, oh my God, you know. So, so cultivating our own capacity to, to be compassionate, to stand in compassion, to be the presence of compassion. What, what are your words of wisdom for us about that? Because it seems like, as you're saying, you know, authoritarianism and the fear, um, it seems to me that compassion is an antidote to fear. Right. Right. So compassion is love for the difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really the practice, you know, the practices, I think they're, in prayer, meditation, whatever practices you do, the most, the basic is to settle into a sense of being worthy and beloved. This being, this being right here is worthy and beloved. And to find that wherever you do, from your, your pet, you know, your memory of your grandma, you know, whatever it is, uh, your, just the place where you can feel the softness of resting on the earth. So we have to ground ourselves in this field of care could come from our ancestors, their love or a benefactor, or, you know, the Buddhists have the Buddha. It could come from the love of Jesus, you know, the Christ consciousness, right? um, that we are part that that's here. So that's the beginning of a practice. Then what happens is resistance. Oh yeah, but, but I'm this, I'm that, you know, the resistance emerge comes up. Um, oh, come on, you know, but they weren't, but I'm not, but it isn't, you know, but, but, <laughs> but. And then the practice is that part that arises with the, is the wound Mm -hmm. is the wound and we all have the wounds the defenses from childhood from our growing up whatever some have it more some have it less but we all have it you know and that needs to be not rejected not judged not hated but included uh embraced seen with kindness and, you know, that's, you know, bringing compassion here, bringing compassion here. And it's, you know, it's resistance, it's fear. It's, so, you know, that's the, that's the ongoing practice. And then to include, you know, for that, to just keep including, you know, just keep including. Um, Cause it's all in here. Yeah. Yes. You know, it's, it's all, all in here, but yeah. That's easier said than done, as you oh, isn't know, it? and I isn't know. It? Oh, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So that's the problem with spiritual work. It sounds, oh, yeah, as you say, it was it? oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> no, it's a journey. <laughs> it's lifelong. It's constantly, it's every day. You know, it's when people irritate me the mm. most, and I ter- and I get frightened. Yeah. But I have to practice when I'm not frightened. Yeah. And that's interesting because I think there's a tendency sometimes to think, oh, it's that group that are governed by fear, but it's not, you know, this is like universal. And I think as soon as we stop externalizing everything and really come inward, and I so appreciate what you're saying about um, to practice that, okay, this being is, how did you say it? Worthy worthy of love and that then the voice of resistance comes. And I think a lot of times we want to push that voice of resistance away, right? Which means we're, then we're breaking the, our alignment with love because love doesn't push anything away. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So continue and- to expand, expand, expand our capacity. What were you going to say? Yeah. You know, when I, I, I've taught a lot of meditation over the years 
And so often people sit down and right away, you know, they think they're going to get blissful or, you know, it's all going to be, um, you know, the mind is going to somehow open and they're not going to have to think and it's going to be, you know, I mean, this happens once in a while, but for the most part, you know, particularly the beginning, you get so much and you see how much judgment there is. And then we say, oh, gee, I'm such a horrible person and I shouldn't be doing this and I shouldn't. And there's so much resistance. And the attitude towards the resistance tends to be judgment. Absolutely. Which is like, you know, I always make it like this. You know, you got a constriction and then you put a constriction over constriction. <laughs> you're more constricted. You got to bring softness to constriction. Right. Right. But it's hard. It's 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 hard. It's transformational. It's it's counter our conditioning and yeah. our wiring. Yes. Yeah, and judgment is the essential separator. Right. Right. It is the thing that causes me to stand here and look at that over there, or causes me to look at some aspect of myself. It is the thing that like fractures fractures the unity of reality in our minds right toward myself and towards you yeah and it's it's everywhere so you know yeah um yeah you know that's um when i was maxing i think it might have been my first meditation retreat that i became aware that's why awareness you know, we want to expand awareness. Yeah. My first meditation retreat, I had like so much judgment. I was devastated when I saw how much judgment was going on. And then I was judging the judging and then judging the judging of the judging. Yeah. You know, judging. It was like no end in sight. It's like Russian dolls. <laughs> Just more and more. Yeah. Right, right, right. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it's quite astonishing when you start to see it. Right. When anyone, you know, starts to see it. Yeah. And you know, yeah, we do have um you know, we need to find the, our own models, whether they be words or beings mm-hmm. or places or as you say, pets, whatever it is, you know, uh that are not perfect, but that communicate that possibility of care yeah to rest in this feels to me yeah um right here that we can work with the mind the heart the body yeah 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 and essentially what we're doing in the end is we are dissolving all those stories that are that are in the mind yeah I know for myself, it helps a lot to focus my awareness on the heart because the heart is already, the heart is not <laughs> caught up in all that. Right, right. Well, Sheila, I want to make sure that we allow plenty of time for questions. And before we move into that, I just want to let people know that you have authored a couple of books. Surprisingly Happy is your uh, spiritual memoir. Right. And your second book was a collection of essays and, and poems called God Loves the Stranger. And your forthcoming book, uh, Stay Tuned, um, will be Let Us All Breathe Together. And you also are a spiritual director. So maybe you just like say a word about that and how that figures into your life and what that means. Yes, to you. yes. Um, thank you. I um, I discovered spiritual direction about 20, 21 years ago, actually, which coming out of the Christian tradition, out of the Catholic tradition, and my first spiritual, oh, although I found out about it from Jews who had found out about it at, in, through Christians, and uh, although there is a ver- Jewish version, of course, of it, but anyway, my first the people that I worked with were nuns. Uh, Sisters of Mercy, and then I did some training with the Sisters of Mercy, and um, for quite a few years, um, over one and a half decades, I suppose, at least, or close to two decades, I suppose, I have been seeing people in spiritual direction, which is just once a month, and now I see students, uh, rabbinical students, in Philadelphia at the Reconstructions, and I also see people at Hebrew Union College in New York, uh, faculty, and various individuals 
uh, mostly Jews, but I have a couple of non-Jews that I see that have sort of come my way in various circuitous routes. Um, and it's an hour where we spend together, an hour in safety. It's a sacrament, really, a safe sacrament, a safe spiritual energy where I have no agenda. I'm not really the director, and it's not even a good name. It's more yeah. of a companion. Yep. It's a companion, a friend. And I'm, I am in spiritual direction myself. Mm-hmm. And I see quite a lot of people. It's actually what I probably do the most of nowadays. Um, and I've seen, I, there are people that I've seen for a long time, probably 17, 18 years. And We sit in silence and people bring up what they bring up. They hear what they hear. They, they offer what they offer and we listen to it. And it's a relational practice in that we both listen deeply and I really channel, I feel like it's a kind of a channeling process where I just open to whatever I open to in this moment. And sometimes I'll ask them a question. Sometimes I'll comment. Sometimes I always ask permission. Is it okay? And, you know, they have no responsibility to accept what I say. But oftentimes for me, I feel like it puts me in a very sacred place to Mm -hmm. be at service to their unfolding. Yeah. So uh, it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And there again, it's the power of relationship. Yep. And the healing power of relationship. Yep. 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 And I, it's very, it's it's very, very beautiful. It's very beautiful. Beautiful for me as a directee and as a director. Um, It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Very blessed. Very grateful and blessed that I found it for my life. Mm. Fabulous. Sheila, this has been wonderful. Thank you so very, very much. There's one more question that came in on our (laughs) Q&A. It's almost like a separate uh, program in and of itself. And do you think organized religion is dying and spirituality is the place where people are turning? Now, like I said, that could be (laughs) a program in itself, but just uh, I didn't know if you might want to reflect briefly kind of as our last question on that back and forth. Well, I can say I can speak about Judaism Mm -hmm. and I could say that if you look at in Jewish history, I'm sure the same is true in Christianity, Islam, there are waves, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not so much about organized uh, versus spirituality. Uh, I think organizations are important. Relationships, communities mm-hmm. are important. Mm-hmm. Will they look differently? Yes, of course. They're going to evolve. They're continuing to evolve. Mm-hmm. Um, my uh, One of my teachers, uh, Mordechai Kaplan, no longer alive, but someone I really, he called Judaism is, and this we could say this about any tradition, an evolving religious civilization. Mm-hmm. With an emphasis on evolving, it's also changing. Right. You know, so who knows what it's going to change into? It wasn't the same, you know, uh, back then, and it won't be the Mm -hmm. same, you know, for our next (laughs) generation. Generation. But I think the human need for groups and meaning and practice and sacrament and Mm -hmm. consciousness and awareness and healing of the mind, body, spirit, you know, is probably going to endure. Well, one thing that comes to mind is that over time, even this new phase of, quote, spirituality in time will kind of become organized. Right, exactly. <laughs> and and what happens, it seems, no matter how old a tradition or new, it becomes organized over time, but then spirit still breaks through exactly. in a new way. Exactly. And so that's what's kind of exciting. It's almost not like what we call it is an old religion or a new spirituality. It doesn't matter. Spirit is going to break through in spite of it. And that's the exciting 
exciting thing that I think we have. Well, listen, you, it's been such a wonderful treat, Rabbi, to have you with us. And Patricia, your dialogues and your conversation have been so great. And to all of you who've come on board and offered things. So we want to say thank you and thank you to to you, especially Rabbi Weinberg. Best of wishes with your new book and uh, your continued work. And I hope you'll consider yourself a a member of the family, the center family. And so we will uh, keep in touch and hopefully have you back again down the road. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Patricia, very much. Well, blessings to all of you. Blessings to all of you. And so before we uh, say goodbye, I want to mention our next program coming up is in just four weeks on December 12th. And we're going to have Susan Teagan. She's a community organizer, an artist, an educator, spiritual mentor who spent most of her life at the intersection of creativity and spirituality, healing and art and transformation. She's the founder of Artwell in Philadelphia that has worked and served over 30,000 at-risk young people and youth in our community. And she's going to lead us in a discussion on healing and transformation that can come through creative expression. So that's a program you don't want to miss, particularly if you have an interest in art or creativity in many different forms. It's not just art, but it's all types of creativity. Uh, Mark your calendar for four weeks uh, from today on December 12th. So remember, uh, visit our website if you haven't done so. There are many resources and videos and online groups that you can participate in and opportunities to join or be a part of the center family. So we're so grateful for your presence, so grateful that you're here. So until we meet again, we'll say stay safe, be well, and to remember, be the love that you are seeking. Namaste.